Hi, my name is Sean Domigal Goldman. I'm at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, although obviously not literally since I'm recording this from my home office on Microsoft Teams. And today I'll be talking about biosignatures, uh, biosignature detection, I should say, via remote sensing. I'll be focusing on exoplanets because that's where my expertise lies, um, although some of this will apply to, uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, solar system biosignature remote sensing as well. If you want a more in-depth uh, version of what I'm going to say today, or if you'd like a broader cross-section of the community's opinions on this or take on this, I, I would direct you towards this special issue of Astrobiology, uh, Volume 18, Number 6. That's the June 2018 issue, which was uh, an issue that published the work from our or the findings from a workshop we hosted on exoplanet biosignatures. Um, I really would would re can't recommend that strongly enough. Like it, you, it, it has a, a really good cross section of community opinions incorporated into it, uh, and like I said, much more detail that I'm going to go into today. I will try to update things a little bit at the end of my talk today, from where we were at the end of that workshop, with my 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 answer on the questions about the future. Um, and here are the questions that was asked by the science organizing committee, who who I first of all I'd like to thank for uh, inviting me to give this talk. I'm really happy to be giving this talk to this audience at this time. I'm glad this workshop is happening, and I'm I'm really honored to be a part of it. So thank you very much for inviting me. And also, thanks for these questions, which which really helped frame this talk for me. Um, and I'm not going to go over them all now. I'll just cover them one by one, starting with the top. What do we think we are looking for when it comes to remote detection of biosignatures? And what we think we're looking for is a, a number of different kinds of biosignatures, and, and I'm going to demonstrate them with examples from Earth. Now, for exoplanets, we're not going to get this level of spatial resolution or temporal resolution. I'm showing this just to demonstrate that, yeah, we can we can see the light does remotely because we're remotely observing this stuff on Earth today. This first example is a map of methane on Earth, which uh, is predominantly produced by life and which we can sense remotely by building an orbiter that uh, has instruments that have spectrographs that, that can detect the wavelengths of light that methane absorbs. Um, and methane is one biosignature you could do this with. Uh, for exoplanets, we've also talked about doing it for oxygen or ozone. For solar system planets, methane has been proposed as a biosignature as well as uh, trace gases, including but not limited to phosphine, which we've heard discussed in the literature recently. And another kind of biosignature, in addition to the gases that light produces, are the ways that life affects the spectrum or the reflectivity of the surface. And that could come in two forms, um, both shown here on this, this one movie. Um, the first is in the oceans, you could see chlorophyll, which is a molecule inside the organism, uh, in this case used for photosynthesis. Um, and on land, you're seeing what's called the red edge effect that's associated with the, the jump in reflectivity caused by plants. In either case, you're kind of de de detecting the organism itself, a molecule the organism is made of in the case of chlorophyll, or the structure or color of the, of the organism in the case of the green on, on land. And either way, again, you can detect this remotely if you've got a, a telescope, or in this case, an orbiter that, that includes a spectrograph that's got the right resolution and uh, spectral resolution and, and, and wavelength range to detect the features you're looking for. And then lastly, you could, in addition to looking for the things that life is made of or the byproducts of metabolism from the biosphere that's present, you could also look for things that a civilization that is present on that planet is uh, doing intentionally. Um, some of these would use the same kinds of techniques and tools and platforms that the prior biosignatures would use, uh, such as looking for light coming from the night side of a planet or looking for the industrial pollutants that are clearly non-natural or perhaps even not uh, clearly not from a, a, a biosphere, but are clearly from an industrialized civilization. Um, you could look for those things. Um, and there's there's other kinds of techno signatures you could look for as well, including communication that's intentional or that's leakage uh, from internal communication inside that civilization. Um, what's interesting to me is, is a lot of those are also uh, require some sort of spectroscopy or, or understanding of, of radiation of different wavelengths. Now, I'm going to focus on the gaseous biosignatures for two reasons. One, that's where my history is, and it's where I feel I've got the most uh, sort of authority or experience to speak from. Um, and secondly, to be frank, that's where a lot of the past history of research has been. Um, I, I want to 
point that out because I, I don't want to give the impression that I think that that's all we should focus on. Um, in fact, I do think there's a case to be made to focus more on some of the other kinds of biosignatures I just mentioned, but I won't give a lot of attention to later today. That's just not where my background is, and, and it's not where a lot of the history in the field has been. So I'm going to dive deeper into gaseous biosignatures, and, and I, I'm going to start with just this: these two takes, which are very similar to each other, but were done independently, on what makes a good gaseous biosignature. Um, in both cases, you're, uh, or in both in both of these papers, which I, as far as I know are were, were, were considered fairly independently, you've got a number of considerations you want the gas. Um, to to pass, for lack of a better word, to to be a good biosignature. You want it to be something that life makes. You want it to last in the atmosphere long enough so that it could build up to detectable levels. And then you want it to be something that it either is not made by non-biological processes or, as I'll discuss in detail later, where you can rule out the non-biological processes that make that gas. Um, the, the canonical biosignature that's kind of historically made it through all of those considerations is oxygen, along with the photochemical byproduct of oxygen, which is ozone. It's made by plants. You can see it here literally bubbling up from a leaf that's put underwater for a kid's science experiment, which you, you can do with your kids at home. I'm planning to do that with mine later this summer. Um, and that oxygen, once it's made by plants, can accumulate in the atmosphere to very high concentrations, like to 20%, which is what it what it is in today's atmosphere on Earth. And that's detectable across interstellar space. It's also very hard to make oxygen or ozone without biology producing it because it's rapidly destroyed, both by photochemistry and by, by, by photolysis directly and also from reaction with other chemicals in the atmosphere. And if it's being destroyed rapidly and needs to be uh, produced rapidly to replenish it, that high flux of oxygen to the atmosphere required to sustain oxygen or ozone at high enough concentrations for detection, that flux is orders of magnitude higher than the non-biological fluxes you'd get um, of oxygen and ozone. And it's at orders of magnitude difference in flux that we think is the true biosignature. Now, that said, there have been some folks, including myself, that have tried to look at ways you could do that, that where you could make enough oxygen or ozone so that you could detect it across the interstellar space um, without any biosphere being present on the planet. Uh, there's a nice, actually, that Meadows paper I quoted a couple slides ago uh, the, the, from 2016 had a nice review of the, the research into oxygen as a biosignature and into all these mechanisms that could make oxygen abiotically without a biosphere present on the planet. This is the cover image from the issue of astrobiology in which that appeared. And I, and I recommend you take a look at that. Now, the reason we did that, the, the, that we looked at oxygen and ozone, we weren't just trying to take the canonical biosignature down a few pegs. We were doing it because we wanted to understand what the implications of that would be for missions. Oxygen being the canonical biosignature, uh, along with its, its byproduct ozone, we're, we're kind of at the heart of all the, all the past mission and all the current mission designs that we've been making for exoplanet uh, spectroscopy missions. Basically, if you're if you're designing a mission to find biosignatures on exoplanets, you kind of start with uh, can it detect oxygen and or ozone. And what we wanted to do is if those missions were going to be designed around that, at least as a starting point, we'd want them to also be able to discriminate between planets that had oxygen or ozone but were dead, and those that had oxygen or ozone that originated from a biosphere. And we were able to do that. So oxygen and ozone, we now know that there are ways to make it, but they're fairly um, limited in, the, in, in the, the planetary context and the stellar context in which that can occur. And let, that lets us do things like this, which you don't have to read in detail. But I put it up here to point out that because we thought about the ways that a dead planet could make that canonical biosignature of oxygen. We now know what other observations we need to make, what order we can make them in, what wavelength range that implies for the mission we're looking at, and the spectral resolution for the instrumentation on that, that, that mission as well. Which means that if we were to find oxygen or ozone on an exoplanet, we could have the same mission do a follow-up observation to rule out the non-biological pathways for making oxygen or ozone. And as I'll talk about later, we've done that for other gases as well. We've done it for methane, for example. And I think we should continue to do that as we move forward. Consider those non-biological production mechanisms and then figure out how to discriminate between the dead planet that makes that putative biosignature gas and the true living biosphere that does. 
right, so the next question is, where are we exploring? Again, I'm focused on exoplanets here in this talk. You could look for remote biosignatures on, on well, just about any, any planet in the solar system, especially the atmosphere-bearing ones. For exoplanets, we've got a lot of choices in, in, in some sense. We've got thousands of exoplanets we've discovered, and there's two considerations that we put into which ones would be the best to, do, to conduct a search for, for biosignatures on. And the first is with regards to habitability, and not habitability in a theoretical sense, but in a practical one. Um, I know that the habitable zone term can be a little bit um, uh, of an off-putting one to our colleagues that look at for, for signs of life or habitable environments in parts of our solar system that are beyond that technical habitable zone. Um, but the reason that the habitable zone exists is really about global biospheres. We want to look for global biospheres because we think that to detect a biosphere across interstellar space, it's going to have to have a really robust signature. Um, to have and for that, we think it will have had to have proliferated all, all across the surface of the world um, and, and to be in close contact with the atmosphere. Um, and so that's why we want a global liquid water bearing planet which is what the habitable zone is really about. So if that term bugs you, just do a search for place of habitable zone for global biosphere zone or global liquid water zone. And, and that that's really what we mean. It's it, it's about that global habitability. And so only a, some, a subset of these thousands of planets that we found with, with Kepler and TESS and ground-based observations and other observatories, only a fraction are in the habitable zone and only a fraction are of the right size to allow for that global habitability. Additionally, um, only some of these planets are going to be amenable to follow-up observations in spectroscopy. The stars are billions of times brighter than the planets that we want to look at. Um, and in addition to that, the planets are really dim because they're small. Not just dim compared to the star, they're just dim overall, period, full stop. Which means you need a telescope that's really big to collect the light from that very dim planet. Or, and or you need a way to leverage the light of the star, which is brighter, to get some information from the planet itself. All right, and so ultimately you really need three things in a mission that's gonna look at spectroscopy from exo, ex, uh, habitable exoplanets. Um, you need a big telescope, you need a way to cancel out the starlight, and then you need a way to analyze the spectrum of the light that has interacted with the planet somehow, its atmosphere and or its surface. I'll come to the different techniques for that in a bit. Now, if you asked me five years ago, I would have said that that we didn't have many near-term prospects for this, because although we had JWST on the horizon, none of the targets we had were good enough for that. And it, we, it really would have required perfect targets, and I didn't anticipate us getting those perfect targets. Well, about five years ago, we did. Uh, we got this TRAPPIST-1 system, which is amazing in so many ways. It has, first off, a number of planets, which opens it up to some comparative planetology investigations, which are really fun regardless of the biosignature search. It also has a couple of those worlds, uh, a few of those worlds, uh, it, it potentially in the habitable zone or, or that are potentially habitable. And then lastly, the system itself is very close to us and it has a star at its center, an M-type star, that's not too bright, which, which lowers the planet to star contrast ratio. And all of that makes it really favorable for observation. Um, again, five years ago, I would have told you, I'm not counting on us being successful here in the near term because we would have needed pretty much perfect targets. And then, like I said, we got these targets, which are pretty much perfect. So that's, I, TRAPPIST-1 is probably the most famous of these systems, but there's a handful of other ones that are really, really good that we, we should be able to get some information from potentially habitable worlds in the near-term future with either the James Webb Space Telescope or ground-based extremely large telescopes. Now, there's two ways to get the spectral information. I talked about you need a big telescope, you need uh, a way to get spectra from the planet, and you need to block out the starlight or account for the starlight. Um, the two methods I'm going to talk about real quick are transit spectroscopy, which is what JWST will use, and the first generation of the extremely large telescopes on the ground will use to analyze rocky exoplanets in the habitable zones of other stars. Now, the transit technique works. It gets the spectra from the planet by separating out the planet spectrum basically by time. You, you look at what the spectrum of the star-planet system is when the planet's at different points in the orbit, most notably when it's in front of or behind the star, when you're not getting as much, uh, when it's in front of or behind the star, compared to when the planet's on the side. If you look at kind of those three cases in general, and you can do some things with the full orbit that are, that are a little bit more nuanced, but if you look at those three cases, you can isolate 
the the spectrum, or the part the part of the spectrum that's being filtered through the planet's atmosphere, and that lets you basically get a spectrum of the planet's atmosphere. Now, this is best for planets around M-type stars, which are cooler and smaller than Sun-type stars. It's most sensitive to the upper parts of the planet's atmosphere, um, and it's also severely impacted by clouds. Now, the other technique, which is a little bit further off um, for that last bullet, it, it, it is direct imaging. Now, direct imaging, the downside is it requires significant technology development to, that we haven't done yet. We know how to do it. We're investing in it. We expect to have it online for the next generation observatories. But it, as of today, it's not sufficient for the the, mission, the observatories that are using direct imaging or, or high contrast imaging to, to get the Earth-like planets in the habitable zones around sun-like stars. Now, unlike the transit spectroscopy case, these are better for sun-like stars. They work worse for M-type stars and, on, uh, and vice versa. The transit technique is worse and might not even ever work for FGK-type stars. High contrast direct imaging also probes the entire atmosphere effectively because the light you're seeing has originated at the star um, at least for the UV to near IR versions of these, it bounces off the surface of the planet and passes through the atmosphere twice. It's also less sen less sensitive to clouds for that reason. Clouds are always going to be an issue, but they're not sort of a showstopper for direct imaging in the same way they can be for transit uh, spectroscopy, at least for near-term missions. Um, but that downside is they're further off because we're still developing the technologies to the levels they're needed for for the habitable worlds. Now, the cool thing about transit spectroscopy, the, the best, in my opinion, is that we can do it sooner because the technologies uh, are basically there. They've been incorporated into a telescope. Um, even though the telescope was not designed to do exoplanet spectroscopy of, of rocky habitable zone worlds, JWST is such an awesome piece of machinery that exists and has been built and tested and is about to launch um, that we're going to pretty soon have some kind of information from these worlds with that transit spectroscopy technique. Um, and, and here's a simulation of both what's promising about that kind of observation, but also what's perilous and challenging about them. Uh, this is work by Thomas Fauché and colleagues where what he's done is he's he's made a, a, a spectrum here, actually two versions of the same planet and, and a, a simulation of what JWST might see for that planet. The first, which I'm going to show in black, is uh, basically the spectrum for a planet with a clear sky, no clouds in it. And you can see these peaks are from uh, water or carbon dioxide absorption in the atmosphere. In transit spectroscopy, peaks are, 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 are what result from absorption. He then adds clouds to the model, and, and any world that's habitable is almost certain to have clouds, and this is the bad news. When you add the clouds to the simulation, you get this blue line, which is much flatter. You don't see all these absorption features from water and carbon dioxide like you do in the black curve, um, and it's it's pretty dim. Um, and and this is bad because it means that we we might be able to see whether or not this planet has an atmosphere according to these simulations, but it's going to be really really hard to see the biosignatures themselves. Um, Jake Lustig Jaeger also did similar calculations on what we, you know, how, how many transits, how much of JWST time would it take for the different Trappist worlds and for different versions, different model versions of those worlds. Um, and, and for some of them, you don't need a lot. Um, but 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 this is really just to detect the presence of the atmosphere. It's to know that the spectrum isn't flat. Uh, you would need more. This is just the number of transits you need for each of these permutations. Um, for some, you only need a few, and this is quite affordable. For the one bar water uh, rich atmosphere, the habitable atmosphere with clouds, it's going to take dozens of spectra. That's going to be expensive. It's probably worth doing just because we, we're going to learn a lot there. But this is not enough to get us the biosignatures themselves. The biosignatures are going to be hard. Uh, they're going to take a lot of time. Um, and it's worth looking at these worlds and getting the spectra of these worlds. And, and we might find something interesting there. But I will tell you my honest expectation is that we're not going to see the level of us uh, the we're not going to get good enough signal to noise to, to be able to search for or detect biosignatures on these worlds and that's not a knock on jwst it, in fact it, it i'm i'm impressed that it can do any of this at all without being purpose built for this kind of thing and this is where myself and the rest of the exoplanet rocky uh uh, uh habitable zone uh uh community turns into Abe Simpson shaking our fist at clouds because it's the clouds that really are the problem here. Um, the transit technique also has, uh, it's not as good as direct imaging in many ways, um, but especially if you got clouds, just not good.
So that was kind of both how we'll explore, but also what our current limitations are. To get around those limitations, I, I think we need to go to direct imaging. And it has those advantages I mentioned earlier. You can look at the Earth-like planets around the sun like stars. You don't have as many issues with clouds. They're not showstoppers. Um, and uh, we can do this for quite a large number of worlds, as I'll get to in a little bit. Now, we have two mission concepts for flagship scale observatories that would do this at different levels of ambition that's shown on the left. This is Louvoir on, on, on the top and Habex on the bottom. This is not to scale. Louvoir is by design much bigger. It's more ambitious than Habex. Uh, both, both missions, though, like regardless of ambition, it's really about how many times they would do this kind of observation. Both missions would be able to do the direct imaging observation I talked about earlier, the, the reflected light spectroscopy. Um, and the way that works is you block out the star physically with some coronagraph or star shade. Um, and then the light that's left over is, is from either the dust in the planetary system or from the planets themselves. And this is what you really want to see. You want to see a bright thing in the habitable zone and get a spectrum of it. This is a, a simulation of what that image would look like using the bigger version of Louvoir looking back at the solar system from 12 and a half parsecs away. You could get a similar image uh, with a smaller version of Louvoir or, or with Habex if you were looking at a, at, at a solar system twin that's that's closer to us than 12 and a half parsecs away. So this image would still be quote unquote true um, just for a different, a different system that you'd be targeting. Now, this is a, a simulation of what the spectrum would look like because you don't just want those points of light. You want to spread that pale blue dot out into its constituent colors to look for those features from the biosignature gases. And now just think about before I had those the, just water and CO2 and it was really flat if you included the clouds. Here's a simulation of what Louvoir might see um, for a planet that's 10 parsecs away. And you can see absorption features, which are now down. This is confusing, and I apologize for, for <laughs> what the exoplanet community does to spectra and flipping their axes. But for a direct imaging reflected light uh, observation, you have uh, absorption associated with being uh, – is, is shown as being down on the, on the diagram as opposed to up, which is what I was showing before. So that now the valleys are absorption features. So for for this for this simulated spectrum, you can see absorption from ozone. You can see a broad feature. I'm sorry, from oxygen here, a broad feature from ozone over here. There's a shoulder feature here from methane. You can start to accumulate a library of gases that you know are in that planet's atmosphere, um, and the signal to noise on the detection of those gases is quite good. Um, and this was a simulation that included clouds in it. So the clouds. It impacts the, the continuum, but it doesn't impact your ability to get at these gases. By the way, I should mention that this is a simulation for Louvoir, but again, Habex could also do something like this for a different system that's closer up. And bonus, an awesome telescope is also an awesome telescope. Turns out that if you can do, if you build the observatory that's required to do the exoplanet direct imaging, that observatory, and this would also be true for Habex, would also be outstanding for remote sensing inside our solar system. So if you're into a biosignature search remotely in the solar system, Louvoir or Habex would be excellent for that as well. Now, for both of these, we, we leveraged the work or, 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 or built off the work that Jada Arni and colleagues did on how we would detect not just the biosignatures from modern day Earth, but throughout Earth's history. For example, Archean Earth, we think had no oxygen or very little oxygen in its atmosphere and no detectable ozone or oxygen but it had life for about a third of the history of life on Earth. And, and we wanted to be able to detect that kind of world. So we built Louvoir and Habex, or I should say, we didn't build it yet, gosh, wish we had. We designed or conceptualized Louvoir and Habex to be able to detect not just the biosignatures on Archean Earth were without oxygen, but also to discriminate between an Archean Earth-like world and a planet like Titan that has methane that comes from, we think, non-biological sources. Now, as we're thinking about those future missions, I also want us to think about what we need to do in the future for research and for the theory of biosignatures, which is what my last few slides will be on. Um, the first, I'm going to just talk to Jake Lustig Yeager's work as an example of us doing a more thorough consideration of surface biosignatures, because basically everything I've been talking about, as I alluded to earlier, is about gaseous biosignatures. Now, there is work on surface biosignatures, but I don't think um, as broad of a community has looked at it, especially on the, the side of simulating what a Louvoir or Habex might see. And I think we could do a lot more there. Um, I think I think the same thing is true for techno signatures. There's a couple papers just coming out the last few years on what we could do with Louvoir or Habex for techno signatures. And I think we need to see more of that as well. 
Uh, there's also this excellent work by Tessa Fisher, which is uh, taking us in a, uh, I would say it's quantifying our intuition. I think there's a lot of good intuition and, and consistent intuition we've built up as a community of uh, of exoplanet biosignatures researchers. And, and we we might all nod our heads and agree with each other, but it'd be better if we had a way to quantify that consensus intuition. And and Tess, Tessa Fisher's work, which, which is about uh, analyzing the complexity of the photochemical network in the atmosphere as a proxy for whether or not life is present there, um, is one way to do that. And I think an awesome way, I, I think we need other, I think we need to continue that and I think we need to develop others because these quantified methods are really, really important for, for the eventual observation and our discussion thereof with the other scientists and with the general public. And then the last thing, so that the things I just mentioned are kind of at the top. For the future, I think we need more research into non-gaseous biosignatures, um, just because we've we've really focused on those in, in 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 history. The second thing is, as I mentioned, we need to quantify our intuition and come up with ways to do that. And then the last thing is, I think we need to look at earth science as and and, and specifically research into climate change as a guide to how to be better in how we analyze these things and i'm going to just take a minute here for my last slide to to talk about that and, and this is in my opinion one of the most important figures or series of figures that that have has come out in the last 100 years of of research in the sciences and what this is is it's three plots one is i'm going to start with the black line the black line in each of these is for land ocean and land and ocean surface. The black line is our planet's surface temperature history for the last 100 years, or in the case of the ocean heat content for the last 50 or so. The pink uh, range is, a, is the range of model uh, predictions of that temperature evolution, which you can see is quite good. And what's key about this pink is it includes everything we know about Earth, all the all the complex forcings on climate, including the stellar variations, the the volcanic forcings, human emissions, biological emissions that are not human induced, everything is included in this pink chart or the, this 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 pink line. That's sort of the the range of outcomes we get from the models. And what's really good is it matches the temperature record really well. Well, so what's up with the blue line? Why doesn't that match? The answer to that question is that that's the same models where we've taken out the natural forcings. And I, I think that's just, first of all, it, it's profound at how well we can capture the increase in temperature over time when we include the anthropogenic forcings, but how poorly we capture it when we don't. That that a clean, very clean A-B result in the context of all the myriad complex interactions of Earth's climate is just, it's beautiful. It's just a beautiful model experiment. And to me, it's one of the more convincing p sets of evidence that climate change is not just real, but caused by humans. Um, and I think with something that could be as contentious and controversial as the statement, we are not alone, in the context of, context of something that is also complex, because you're also talking about looking at one data set like a spectrum um, in in that that results from a set of complex interactions between multiple systems at the surface of a of a ocean bearing world, and you want to know is that one spectrum or that's that 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 time varying spectrum, whatever that that data set is, you, you want to know is that caused by biology or not? And I think, like just as one of many examples we could take from climate science, it would be super powerful if we had models like this that a captured the complexity of interactions in that habitable planet, and B, gave us sort of the ability to turn the biological fluxes, the ecosystem fluxes at the global scale on and off. So we could do this clean experiment where we say, can we reproduce the data with biology and can we not reproduce it without the biology? That kind of experiment was so critical to, at least in my opinion, to, to, uh, to our arguments and our understanding of uh, attributing climate change to human activity. And I think the same thing could be true if we can develop this kind of model for the future for, for the exoplanet biosignature research. But that's just one example of the broader set of, I think there's other things we could do with inner model comparisons and the way that the, those folks use language and such. I am well past time and apologies for taking up more of your time than I was supposed to. I think I was supposed to come in at 25 and I'm in at 30, but I thank you so much for your time uh, and I really appreciate it. And I look forward to discussing this and other things at this workshop. Thank you.